the enemy shore off Korea. Those mountains are alive with guns, ammunition and supplies on their way to the communist front. Our ship is here to see they don't arrive. In the moment before the big guns start firing, there's always a certain tenseness reflected in the quiet attitudes of the men at general quarters. With the guns moving into firing position, I take my station on the bridge, feeling, as every battleship captain at times like this, the responsibility of command. For this is a war in which every broadside must count. It's when the guns are firing efficiently, like this, that you can be proud of your crew down below. It takes men with Navy know-how in the turrets to feed those big guns. Men who've learned their job through long hours of training and hard work. Coordination and teamwork move the shells smoothly into position. And that's TNT in powder bags, which must be handled delicately and surely. It takes six of those charges to hurl a shell deep down the communist throat. Stand by! Stand by! Those guns must be aimed properly, too. For this job, my officers are at work in the main battery plot. These gunnery officers are tackling the fire control problem of the action we call interdiction, the destruction of enemy supply lines and rear area facilities. Right, who wants seven? Oh. Our mission off Korea, to halt the full supplies which keep the communist armies fed and equipped. Mostly, we concentrate on the coastline railways, bridges, supply dumps and depots. But we can shell targets as far as 20 miles inland when necessary. And planes off our carriers can take care of targets farther inland. In emergency, our ship has been put to work in shore bombardment. My men like the job. They call it exporting steel to some tough customers. I call it making a battleship captain feel pride in his command. But elsewhere at sea, we're still engaged in our traditional job with the fleet. The floating fortress, which provides anti-aircraft and heavy gun protection for the carriers and smaller ships, and forms a nucleus for offensive action when required. But there's another side to this ship and the guns are stilled and the battle's over for a while. That's when she comes to mean something more than a fortress. Something a lot more personal to her men aboard. Something all hands can call home. Of course, you've got to keep a home clean. And here are some of my boys doing homework. To make the varsity on this ship, you have to be a member of the scrub team. Cleanliness is a personal thing, too, and we hold inspections 
boots often enough to keep the ship and her crew in trim. Tons of clothes arrive in the ship's laundry during the year. Dungarees and whites receive the full treatment in the tubs until they're hauled out limp but clean. What makes a ship happy? Part of the answer is having all the facilities of a hometown, including a well-equipped bakery. It takes 850 loaves of bread a day to feed our crew of 2,700 men. But the specialty of any bakery is their cake. And here, a baker cuts his masterpiece into enough small pieces to satisfy the crew. Of course, life isn't all cake and neither is Navy chow. What this cook is cutting, in case landlubbers don't recognize it, is beef. Good, juicy, inch-thick steaks. Hungry? The steaks won't be ready until tomorrow, but meanwhile, there's good news on the grill. Sizzling ham. Tastes as good as it looks, and the men are happy to stand in line to prove it. Chow down, fore and aft. And the crew starts attacking that chow with the zest it deserves. In another compartment, the Marines are aboard, are having a birthday celebration. The Admiral is on hand to join in the festivities. But the high point of the affair seems to be the dessert. Man, that's real eating. On a ship as on shore. You can't keep up with the world without a newspaper. We publish our own in the print shop and get to read it after the editors finish admiring their own work. There's a ship service where you can buy everything from watches to soap. Not as big as the corner drugstore, but just as well supplied for Navy needs at the ice cream fountain, the star attraction is the Big Dipper, and the crew seems to appreciate it. Medicine for all the crew's ills comes from this compartment, the pharmacy. The formula this hospital corpsman is mixing looks rather mysterious. In another medical compartment, our eye, ear, nose, and throat specialist looks a little mysterious himself. Skilled Navy doctors are on board with modern surgical equipment to handle any emergency in the operating room. But for some of the sheiks of the crew, the real emergencies happen in the barbershop, where a short clip can be the unkindest cut of all. The mail room is the most popular spot in the ship. By this time, most of the crew have learned that the only way to earn their letter is to write one. And these are going out by air. A waiting helicopter is ready to start them on the first lap of their journey across half the world. Below decks, the activity of this mighty ship is ceaseless. In the engine room, the Black Gang on the job, keeping the propellers in motion. The machine shop is the mechanical repair center of the ship. A combination of skilled hands and modern equipment grinds, molds, and refits gears for use. The electrical shop is the maintenance center for the miles of wire on a battleship. Here, an electrician rewinds just a few feet of it. Mechanical spare parts for almost any emergency line the shelves of this shop, including pipe fittings, bolts, shackles, and grinding stones. If you want to get the word, this is the place to go. In fact, the ship's library stocks millions of them, written by the world's finest authors. This man, high up the coast of Korea, takes a moment off to read about more glamorous regions down under. Sooner or later, almost every man needs legal advice of one sort or another, a legal officer is aboard to give expert advice and aid when needed. 
In this shop are the men who keep the Navy from coming apart at the seams. A skillful use of needle and thread, applied with modern sewing machines, keeps uniforms as good as new. Shoes take a beating on the spacious decks of a battleship, and sooner or later they all end up in the cobbler's shop for repairs. Among other qualifications, a cobbler has to like the taste of nails. So another day off the enemy coast of Korea has passed. Our ship has grown one day older, and the crew and myself one day wiser in the ways of battle in these far eastern waters. And now, at sunset, one of my men steps up to make an announcement. Now hear this. All hands silence for sunset prayer. This is Chaplain Kapolsinski with the Sunset Prayer. Oh my God, as we prepare for rest tonight, we place our souls into thy hands, giving thee again our last thoughts of this busy fighting day. We desire that you always occupy the first and main place in our lives. We thank thee for thy loving care and protection during this day of battle. Increase in us, O oh Lord, faithfulness to our duties, so that our preparedness may keep our country safe. Be with us when we are lonely and miss the dear ones back home. Be with them as thou art with us. Help us to keep our hearts pure and our hands clean. Protect us in the hour of danger, and be thou our shield and defender. Cause war to cease, we pray. And when peace comes, may we do our part in the building of a new and better world in which love shall prevail and the Spirit of Christ cover the earth. May it be thy will to grant us an early peace. Amen. So dawn breaks again in these waters, and briefly in the morning quiet, a kind of peace seems to reign. Yet those of us aboard this ship, captain and crew, know the day may bring battle and turmoil, along with its daily ration of work, laughter, and just plain living. When it does, we'll be ready. For this is the life you ask for when you serve aboard a battleship floating fortress of the nation's fleet.